Let's start off talking about an introduction to mountain lions here in California. We'll talk about these critters over the course of the semester in different ways and examples and contexts, but let's start off with just uh, an introduction. Now, this is a big giant painting about th three times the size of the screen here in real life. It's a big oil painting. My office at Stanford was right next to this, the Stanford Art Museum, and this was in the Stanford Art Museum. Um, when I went to Stanford, uh, I was walking across the campus the very first time, and I looked down, and it said, Junior University. I was like, wait, what? So the campus of Stanford was created as an homage to the only son of Leland and Jane Stanford. He died as a young boy, and they were heartbroken. And so to, to memorialize this kid, he, they, they created a university, right? Um, and for context, Leland Stanford was one of the original four robber barons. It was like the Elon, he was like the Elon Musk slash Mark Zuckerberg kind of thing of, of his day. So he got wealthy uh, with the gold rush. But like most people, they didn't get wealthy on gold, they got wealthy on the business of gold mining. And so that's, what, that's how Leland Stanford made his money. He, he sold shovels and, and things of that nature to, to folks and then parlayed that into a bigger thing and a bigger thing and a bigger thing and a bigger thing. Eventually, he was governor, he was senator, super powerful guy. So why is Stanford where Stanford was? Stanford is where it is located in Palo Alto because at the time, the Stanfords lived in San Francisco. And San Francisco got very cold and dank and, and foggy in the summertime. So they wanted a place they could go that was warm in the summer, like all the time warm. And so they went down the San Francisco, all the way down the San Francisco Peninsula, almost to San Jose, until they found a spot that was almost always warm and sunny in, in the summertime. And that's why, why the university is where it is. And that's why the university has a nickname, The Farm because it was originally their ranch and their farm. And they just built the university on their property. So it was basically a country estate. So this painting, which is meant to memorialize the Stanford family, um, there's, all, there's all kinds of things going on here. Right? We probably build a whole class just on this one painting, right? Of the racism, and we have servants, and the in, insane opulent wealth, right? We play croquet on grass, right? This is before lawnmowers, right? So keeping that grass short is, that's a lot of manual labor. Um, and on and on and on. So this, this was like a, uh, a, a Facebook or an Instagram of the day, right? So this painting was created to memorialize the family. And so everybody's in their super expensive clothes and all this and that, and they're all members of the family. This guy right here is, is Leland Stanford, right, the patriarch. This is his son that passed away. Uh, this is actually the artist that painted the painting. He put himself in because, you know, whatever, want to memorialize himself, uh, Thomas Hill. Um, but the reason we're showing this is not to talk about the opulence or this or that, but is this right here. So this thing, this skin on the ground. That is a mountain lion. Now, this is not what a mountain lion actually looks like because with these big giant paintings, it would take the painters a long time to paint, right? So it's, it's unclear whether Thomas Hill really ever really saw a mountain lion uh, oh, because clearly he painted this guy with spots and they don't have spots except when they're little teeny tiny cubs just for a, a few weeks, basically. So he, he clearly put this down, sketched it, and then later on did some embellishment. But what's the symbolism here? What, what, do, you, what do you guys see the symbolism here with this, with this uh, mountain lion skin on the, on the grass here? Any ideas? Totally. Wealthy enough to say, hey, I want that thing dead. Kill that thing. Get, bring it to me. Good. What else? Let's say again. Yeah, so pretty much like, hey, that's a predator, kill it, right? That thing belongs under my feet, right? That thing, that thing belongs where my babies should sit so they're not touching the grass, right? So, I mean, how much more literal can you be that you've killed the thing and you're standing on top of it or, 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 
or your children are playing on top of it, right? So that's the classic view of mountain lions. They're pests. Their value is when we kill them, right? Their value is when they're not in the landscape anymore. And really, we have these three dominant views of mountain lions over time. And so I would say the, 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 there's the, either these three individually or in combination or how most people tend to view this, um, this predator. So one is over here in the 50s with this mountain lion driving over this jalopy over the Golden Gate Bridge, like, er, 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 like, wah, 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 na, 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 like crazy, right? You know, something you'd see on late night TV or something, right? Kind of, oh, shucks. That's, that, that crazy uh, mountain lion, right? It's an oddity. It serves to be like a, uh, an entertainment, uh, something you see in a circus type of thing, right? That's one. Another is this. So this is Gary Larson cartoon, this Far Side cartoon. And it says biodiversity preserves. And there's all these animals in jars, right? And so that's the classic, oh, we love elephants. We love to go on safari and look at the elephants behind the glass. And they're so majestic, right? When they're in their curated space, right? In a controlled environment. And we can look at their aesthetic beauty and be wondered and wonder over them, right? And then a third dominant uh, view in the culture is this. This is a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon on the bottom. Um, and uh, if Dr. Ryan would here, who he lives for Calvin and Hobbes, he'd be so excited they put a Calvin and Hobbes in my lecture here. But so it's, it's Calvin and Hobbes. It's, it's, it's the boy and the little, little tiger. And he says, uh, I wonder why man was put on earth. What's our purpose? Why are we here? And the tiger looks over and says, tiger food and smiles and goes to sleep and the kid's like, oh, what's going on, right? So, so this idea of threat, this idea of there's something menacing about this predator and if I'm not careful, I'm gonna get killed by this predator. So one of those three things, the kind of eerie, 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 or they're so beautiful, but they're beautiful like away from us, or they're a direct threat. Those seem to be the most common ways that historically our society has viewed mountain lions and things like mountain lions. Um, and then we can talk about the ways they're portrayed, um, uh, it, it, other examples how they're portrayed. So this is my, my son is a sophomore in college. So this, he was, this was a little bit a while ago. Um, but we're at the, on the edge of the Grand Canyon and he's holding a book, uh, a Zane Gray book uh, that's, that's titled Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon, right? So this, this is a book that's all about the man's man they would go and kill them pumas, right? Kill them varmints. And they're like, you know, man, and I go and I ride horses and I shoot things and, you know, brah, and I chew and I have no emotions and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so that sort of very macho kind of Western idea of, of attacking nature, sort of suppressing nature, uh, 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 testing myself against nature and then defeating it, that kind of idea. This next one up here on the right is at the Roadkill Cafe in the town that was um, the model for Cars, the Disney movie Cars, right? And uh, just in the back of this uh, 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 shop, there's a mountain lion mounted and just stuffed behind the television, right? So, so uh, like, what? On, on so many levels, it's like, look at this great thing, and by the way, the baseball game's on, so let's pay attention to the baseball game. Um, the bottom one on the right is a mounted mountain lion, one of the only ones I've ever seen that's mounted the way they are in nature. Most of the museum uh, uh, specimens or, or trophy specimens, or whatever that people put up, they're, they're very menacing. They're, their claws are out, they're like snarling, and they're you know, kind of on their haunches, and they're like, I'm gonna attack you. They're never like that, ever, ever, ever. This is what they're actually like, quiet, crouching down, waiting. They are a, an ambush predator. They're a sit and wait predator. They're not some kind of big, like grizzly bear bumping through the forest saying, I'm gonna get you right there. But, but yet that's how we portray them, right? We portray them as this big dangerous thing that's actively trying to do us ill. In this case, because this is Mesa Verde National Park, the National Park has done a much better job of properly um, portraying what this organism was like um, in nature. Okay. So next we're gonna watch uh, about 10 minutes of video clips, a montage, and I'll explain it all after,
But first, I just want you guys to watch it, right? So it might be a little disturbing as you see a critter get killed here. Um, but this, is, this was essentially my trial by fire when I started working on, well, I was, I was working on mountain lions for a little bit before this, but, but the, the first big thing I had to deal with. So this is um, 20 years ago in Palo Alto. Now, before, before, I, um, before I play it, I'll just say Palo Alto, if you guys have not been there, it's kind of like sort of Thousand Oaks, oh, kind of like partly Thousand Oaks, partly Ojai, very, very uh, wealthy area, but also very much on the interface, the wildlands urban interface. A lot of creeks running from the, the hillsides behind down to the San Francisco Bay. And so very urbanized, but, the, but very urbanized right next to a lot of open space. Um, grasslands, oak woodlands, things like that. Um, and, uh, and so I'll also say it always, starts, it always starts with the UPS dude. The FedEx guy, the UPS man are always involved with this. And that's, that's how this thing first set off. So I'll just let you watch the videos and then we'll unpack them after. Cool? Let's check it out. Music from Alanis Morissette. Now your local news. Get back! A CBS 5 exclusive, a mountain lion loose in the suburbs. CBS 5 was the only station there when police took action. Tonight, angry claims that the animal didn't have to die. The immense power of an assault rifle in the wrong hands will track the spray of bullets that tore through a neighborhood and hit five people. The most wanted man in Iraq scores a direct hit with a Volkswagen. Tonight, who he killed and how he did it. And a new study reveals the dark side of the low-carb craze. What happens to most dieters within the first year? CBS 5 Eyewitness News starts now. Good evening to all of you. I'm Ken Bastida. I'm Dana King. Remarkable pictures tonight only on CBS 5 as Palo Alto police take aim and take out a big mountain lion in the suburbs. It happened near Embarcadero Road, not far from downtown Palo Alto. Tony Russomano on the growing controversy over the decision to kill. Tony. Dana, the top story tonight is about a cat caught in a tree. But what a cat and what a catch. It ended very badly for the cat, a 110-pound mountain lion. And we have to warn you that this may be a very difficult story to watch. Eight hours after this mountain lion was first seen roaming the streets of residential Palo Alto, CBS 5 found the animal sleeping in a tree, 20 feet above one of the Palo Alto police cars sent out to find it. What happened next is graphic and disturbing. Got it. Okay, got it. Got it. If you ask him if you want to shoot it. Oh, the big cat fell as it turned and died. When the officer, the first officer saw it in the tree, they called for a tranquilizer gun that we had out here. While the gun was en route, the animal started to run from the officer. However, our pictures show the animal only raising its head slightly when it was shot. God damn it. We showed the video to a local member of an animal rights group. I think it's absolutely atrocious what, the way the police behave because obviously the, the animal was not posing a threat to anyone. It was in a tree. White roses and a note protesting the shooting were left at the scene by a woman and her two young sons. It would be better if they... Um, tranquilized it. But there are two schools within a mile. I'm still shaking over it. I'm sad they had to shoot it, but the kids will be home soon from school. That would have been awful. <coughs> Linda Furrier's dog chased the mountain lion up the tree, while Linda's two-year-old child played in the backyard. It is a pity to lose a beautiful animal, but w how would we have all felt had that animal attacked a child? The body and stomach contents of the 110-pound male mountain lion will be examined tomorrow for clues as to why it came into a residential neighborhood. Just last month, Livermore police shot and killed a mountain lion at the gates of the Lawrence Livermore lab after fish and game agents said they could not safely tranquilize it. A study of the carcass found the Livermore lion had been injured, probably hit by a car. And wildlife experts say mountain lion sightings are becoming more frequent in California as the animals adapt to life near urban areas. In the Bay Area, about four or five mountain lions are killed each year under fish and game permits after they become a threat. 
Dana? All right, in Palo Alto, Tony Russomano, thank you. CBS 5 Eyewitness News starts now. Misery loves company. The rest of the country finally feels our pain at the pump. Prices hit $2 nationwide. We're paying even more here in the Bay Area. What's behind the massive spike? The new investigation into price gouging. In Everybody always laughs at that. A shooting at a San Francisco Safeway leaves one man dead and police searching for a possible connection to another murder. And outrage over the shooting of a mountain lion in a Palo Alto neighborhood. Why, police say they had no other choice but to shoot and kill. What may have driven the animal out of the wilderness. Up, up, and away. The now, animal rights advocates are crying foul over the killing of a mountain lion that was prowling in Palo Alto. Police shot the big cat out of a tree at Walnut Drive and Walter Hayes Way. Lynn Ramirez explains why the mountain lion may have wandered so far into civilization. The Palo Alto Police Department has been swamped with calls protesting their shooting of a mountain lion yesterday. The graphic footage captured exclusively by a CBS 5 camera showed what happened when the animal wandered too far into a neighborhood in the heart of the city. Concerned calls have been coming in from around the country. One police captain called it the most vocal response to any officer involved shooting he's seen, whether the victim was an animal or human. I've been here 29 years, and I know of a couple of officer involved shootings in the last five years, and uh, I don't remember receiving as much feedback to our action as we are receiving as a result of this. They could have tranquilized it and gone from there. To me, that would probably would have been a better solution than just shooting it. One animal rights group says officers acted too quickly and that the big cat could have been spared if the department had been better prepared. Was there something that could have been done differently? And clearly, um, people, I think locally but across the country, are concerned about this and want to see these agencies come up with better alternatives. Police say calls had been made for a tranquilizer gun, but stand by the decision to kill the animal because they say it posed an immediate threat to public safety. It was justified in that the animal posed a risk, a safety risk to the community. Um, it was not something that we could contain, uh, being as it would be able to leap fences, jump trees. I have seen tranquilizers work in 15 seconds, and I have seen them never work. Fish and Game officials conducted a necropsy today to see if the animal's carcass could yield any clues as to how or why it wandered so far from open spaces and where most of its natural prey lives. The animal was a three-year-old male in good condition, although slightly underweight at 99 pounds, and its stomach was empty. Officials say it could have been forced out of the wild by a more dominant male and probably followed San Francisco Creek or other creeks leading from the hills into town looking for food and water just trying to survive. Food, water, shelter, and they can be concealed as they, as they move into these areas. Mm -hmm. We're joining you now live from Palo Alto where people have been leaving flowers and notes at the spot where the mountain lion fell yesterday. You know, we've been doing a lot of interviews here, Kate, over these last couple of days, and no one that we've talked to is happy that this mountain lion was killed, although some people think it was justified. Some people will never be convinced that killing a mountain lion was the right thing to do. All right, thank you, Lynn. That's Lynn Ramirez in Palo Alto. A brazen shooting takes the life of a young man in San Francisco. Tonight, we've learned of a startling connection to another fatal shooting this month. Young people rising above the violence. At an event tonight, we meet Bay Area teens who are overcoming obstacles, and they are succeeding. Could more people have been saved during the terrorist attacks of September 11th? That's one of the questions a panel of experts is exploring in New York. Her name was Jenna, and she died when a building collapsed during a recent earthquake. Now, a proposed state law in her memory could keep that from happening to you. Those stories all the news on this Tuesday night, May 18th, 2004. Live from the award-winning Channel 2 Newsroom, complete Bay Area news coverage. This is the 10 o'clock news on KTVU Channel 2, the number one primetime newscast in the country. Good evening, I'm Leslie Griffith. And I'm Dennis Richmond. The Palo Alto Police Department says it is being inundated with complaints following yesterday's shooting of a mountain lion. While officials tell us that it was a clear-cut public safety issue, others wonder if the big cat could have been spared. Channel 2 South Bay Bureau Chief Lloyd LaCuesta is in Palo Alto. He's got tonight's update. Lloyd? Leslie, I'm at the corner of Walter Hayes and Walnut Streets in Palo Alto, and it was off a limb on that tree 
that police shot and killed a mountain lion yesterday. Tonight at the base of the tree, a memorial has grown with people leaving notes that the cougar could have been saved. And throughout today, people came to mourn the animal's passing. Oh, beautiful spirit that you are. Two ministers of the United Church of Christ traveled from Oakland to the site tonight and conducted a memorial service. I came here to pray for the soul of the cat. I came to pray for the souls of those involved with the killing of the cat. We're the invasive species. We're the ones who are needing to learn to live with those who have been here far longer than we have. Today, Fish and Game released the results of a necropsy conducted on the animal. It was a three-year-old adult male weighing 99 pounds. Authorities say it showed no obvious signs of health problems, but its stomach was empty and it was probably hungry. No determination could be made if it was the same animal which may have attacked horses in the hills above Stanford in recent weeks. But the experts say because of its weight, it may not have been able to fend for itself against bigger mountain lions. Palo Alto police say they received 200 calls and emails today about the shooting. There was a risk, but I think that it hadn't hurt anyone yet. They should have done something to get out of killing it. They probably did make the right decision, but I, I struggle with that also because all day I've been very sad for the mountain lion. We wonder whether it was necessary to proceed so rapidly to a killing. Palo Alto police today said the animal was shot because it was a hazard to the community. Fish and game experts told police that if they had used a tranquilizer dart, it would have taken as long as 30 minutes for the drug to work. Fish and game told us over the phone it was the right decision. We don't want to have a tranquilized lion uh, moving around in a residential area. The whole idea is to make sure that mountain lion does not hurt anybody. Tonight, we talked to the owner of the dog that drove the mountain lion up the tree. She says the dog and police may have saved her and her four children from harm. I'll say it's a pity that an animal is, um, a beautiful animal is dead, but I wonder how the community would have reacted had that animal killed a human. Fish and game officials say what happened here yesterday could very well occur again somewhere else. Live in Palo Alto, Lloyd LaQuesta, KTVU Channel 2 News. Lloyd, thank you. Okay, so, uh, right, that's pretty crazy. Um, a bit more detail. So we'll, we'll talk about this now, and I'll tell you what, the full story of what happened. And it's probably worth, um, once I post this lecture back up, you go re-watch those videos now that you know, because you'll know the rest of the story. So, um, uh, okay, so it's, the story starts with, as was mentioned there, a few weeks beforehand in the, on the lands that I was in charge of managing and helping restore and do stuff on, um, we started, and this is, again, like Agura Hills, like Ojai, like Santa Paula, a lot of folks have horses in this, in this community. And so we started getting reports that some horses were getting scratched up, right? Um, and when we went and looked, it, it seemed to be consistent with a mountain lion. Like, no horses were killed, but had some scratches on their haunches, like a mountain lion scratch, that kind of stuff. Um, very weird. A mountain lion should never attack a horse. A horse is a big thing, and a horse can kick with its hooves and break a you know, mountain lion's head or leg, and you know, very, very dangerous. So, so a horse is much too large of a prey item, an adult horse, for a mountain lion to attack. So the fact that a mountain lion was attacking a horse tells you one of two things. It's either um, something's wrong, and the critter is aging and not able to get enough food, has a broken tooth, something, and is basically starving desperate, right? Or it's a juvenile individual, super naive, total, you know, your young brother that's totally stupid, doesn't know what the hell he's doing, and kind of bumbles in, hey, there's a horse, I'm gonna go eat that, and then boom, right? So, so it's one of those two things. It's not a normal adult behavior to go after um, horses. And so we had several reports leading, leading up to this. Number two, um, what was mentioned there about how they disperse into these urban areas is totally true. They typically use um, uh, riparian corridors, right? Use, use these, these areas of natural vegetation and, and you know, walk down, walk down, walk down, and then pop out to look for prey. 
And what appears to have happened in this case is this individual came down out of the hills, was going down the creek, and then popped out and was like, what? And turned right and then was like, what? And then was like, Where, where'd the river go, right? And so actually, uh, the first individual that saw the lion, the first reported it, was one of these UPS FedEx delivery guys, right? Doing like an early morning drop off. He's driving in his panel van. He's like, what the hell is that? That's a mountain lion, right? And, and then over the course of the morning, more calls start to come in. More calls start to come in. There's a mountain lion, there's a mountain lion, there's a mountain lion. And again, remember how most people have, uh, you know, we, we have these sort of archetypal views of this dangerous predator, right? So most people hear that and they go, oh my God, a predator, stay inside. So um, now we, in today's day and age, we routinely use our reverse 911, right? We have it on campus if we have a wildfire or, or whatever, right? But back then, this was a brand new system that had just been installed in the city of Palo Alto. And it was actually the first time they used it. So again, instead of you calling the police dispatch, the police dispatch turned it on and they called everybody in the town of Palo Alto. They got a robocall that says, dangerous mountain lion on the loose stay indoors. If you have kids, keep them inside. You know, pets, get, get them inside. And so the whole town was all tense, right? Uh, the police department canceled everybody's holidays. The people were on, like, on leave that day, like, get in, we have this emergency, we have a mountain lion, right? And nobody can find him. Days getting on, days getting on. It goes to mid-morning. The kids in middle school want to go out for recess. Nope, kids can't go out and play. So now the kids have to do recess inside. And the kids are getting antsy. And now it's getting towards midday. Nobody can find the, find the mountain lion. At this point, the word has gotten out. That's why we have all of this footage. We don't always have footage of these types of incidents. But what happened was, it was getting near noon, and all the local affiliates have a, have a noon TV broadcast, right? And so they had all of these reporters, all, you know, salt and peppered all around the neighborhood. And when I, so I, I ordered this video really quickly the next day because I wanted to capture it. What I really wanted is I wanted the live feed, the entire live feed, but nobody had recorded that. But the live feed happened with that, that group. And so, <laughs> and so what happened was everybody was, was all scattered around. The police were all scattered around. The, mount, the, the reporters are all scattered around. Everybody's freaking out. It's this huge panic, right? And so, <laughs> in a very unfortunate turn of events, there's a cop sitting, leaning against the hood of his car. Now, unfortunately, the gentleman was a little portly, and unfortunately, he was eating a donut. So he was totally playing into all your, your you know, stereotypes of what a cop does. And he's sitting there eating the donut, and across the street is a film crew. That report, that the, the guy that was doing the report and a cameraman, and they're just like bored of tears, like, where are we gonna find something, right? where are we gonna find something? And the reporter just happened to look across, the police cruiser is parked on the street, the cop is leaning against the hood, and the reporter looks right over the guy's head, about 10 feet over the head, and there's this branch, one of those branches of that big oak tree you saw, and the mountain lion is sleeping right above the cop. So, <laughs> what he should have done is go, Dude, look out! He didn't. Instead, he elbows his, um, his camera guy and goes, start filming. So the camera guy's filming, right? They call the, because it's almost noon now, so they call the, the, their station and they go, go live, go live. So they go live. And then, because it's noon, they go, hey, let's feed this to the other region. So it goes national. So it's this live feed and this, <laughs> This poor cop is sitting there with, you know, sugar falling on his belly. And then as it's filming, the reporter goes, officer. And he goes, yeah. And he points up. And the officer looks up and goes, oh, my God. And, uh, uh, and they calls, 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 calls. And the mountain lion's asleep this whole time, right? That's when the SWAT team rock runs up. And as you saw, that was, that was the real footage, right? Walks up. Hey, 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 can I shoot it? Can I shoot it? I have permission to fire? Bang. That was it. That was all the debate. Okay, so pause the story there. We'll talk about what happened next. But in the lead up, this is what actually happened. What actually happened, um, do I have a picture of it? No. Um, 
Um, well, that, that black Labrador, that super overweight, very old Labrador retriever that probably couldn't get a squirrel was in that lady's home with her baby, right? She's, she's, she's at home, she's doing laundry in the, in the um, garage, and the do- there's a dog door, and the dog starts barking. And she's like, what the hell? And the kid is, baby's doing stuff, and mom's trying to get something. Like, Dude, shut up. So she kicks the dog out. So the dog goes outside. Mountain lions are freaked out of dogs. They, they, they hate dogs. They are deathly afraid of dogs. To the point where if we're trying to trap a mountain lion, we use dogs. So trained dogs are, are a great way to spook, to scare, to drive a mountain lion. So this big waddling dog <laughs> it walks out and the mountain lion's like, what the hell? And goes up the tree. And the dog's barking. And so the mountain lion's like, screw it, I'm just gonna sit here and chill, right? Let this dog, and so that's, the mountain lion falls asleep, right? And then that's when it gets caught on television and everything, and, and then he's shot, right? Now, uh, the other things to say before we go on talking about the reaction to this, um, uh, it's very easy, and in all of the, in most of the conservation situations we're gonna talk about, it's very easy to demonize the person that made a mistake, or, or, or the person that, that made a judgment call, like, you know, split second. It's very, very easy, very, very easy to Monday morning quarterback. Just like, I'm Monday morning quarterbacking how horrible Dak Prescott's ability to throw interceptions are, but that's another story. So, um, so uh, the police, not trained for this, right? Police are trained to deal with all kinds of other things, not mountain lions. And all of a sudden, the whole town is on edge. And all of a sudden, the whole town is saying, when can we go out and the kids need to get out of school and there's all this tension, 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 right? They said they called for a tranquilizer gun. That was true. California Fish and Game, California Fish and Wildlife, um, is the state agency that's in charge of this kind of stuff. They're the ones that have the tranquilizer guns that we call, that come in, and they were called. You heard the officer there say, I've seen tranquilizers, dig an animal down in a minute or two, and I've seen them never work. That is technically true, but if you know what you're doing, it's pretty easy to take these guys down. What they didn't tell you is they called for a tranquilizer gun. The nearest tranquilizer gun was in Santa Cruz, about an hour away, which was still, given how things played out, plenty of time. Budget cuts they didn't have a working firing pin in the tranquilizer gun. So the reality is, they could not have tranquilized it if they wanted to. They say things like, well, you know, maybe it would have worked, maybe it wouldn't have worked. The reality was, small bureaucratic silliness led to the inability to deal with this conservation challenge, right? Like a $5, I don't know what it costs, five, twenty dollars something like that, a cheap amount, a small amount of money. Right? Uh, when we tranquilize these critters, we put in the right amount of anesthetic. If you put too much, they'll stop breathing. If you don't put enough, it won't make them go to sleep. But if you know what you're doing, you can dose it right. My neighbor, my office, the guy in the next office next to me at the time was the former, basically, head of Mexico's EPA. Super famous uh, wildlife biologist who tags large jaguars and stuff all day long. How does he tag them? He has a PVC pipe and a blow, he basically has a blow dart. If they had called us, he totally could have done it, right? I mean, maybe it wouldn't have worked, but there's like probably a 95% chance it would have worked, right? He does this all day long out in rural Mexico and stuff like that, right? So the technology isn't that hard necessarily but again, the command structure, the decision gets very frustrated when everybody's nervous, everybody's worried, everybody's scared, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so flash forward. Then the SWAT officer walks up. Can I shoot it? Can I shoot it? Yeah, boom, bang, boom, dead. The animal falls off the tree, runs a few feet, and then keels over and, and dies, unfortunately. Right? And so that's what's being shown here. So we pick it up. Um, now, when an animal like this is shot, uh, we, uh, you, you, you cannot just randomly shoot a mountain lion, as we'll talk about next. Um, uh, there are laws saying you can't do that. 
Um, if it's a danger to livestock or you or whatever, you can shoot it, and then what happens is the state, after the fact, gives you a permit to shoot one, right? If it's, if it's justified, if it's justified. And so that's what's happened. So they pick this mountain lion up, and they take the mountain lion away, and, but, all, but because it was live on television, and it was this wealthy neighborhood with a lot of powerful people, it was big news. And you heard the officers say, this was one of the most uh, uh, the events that generated massive amount of public unrest. And not just, not, just, not just letters from the local folks, but because it was national news, letters from across the country, phone calls from across the country, right? In some cases, more than officer-involved shootings, all kinds of other things you'd think would generate all kinds of, this was dramatic and it was very um, in everybody's face. And so it's all over all the newspapers, all over all the television stations, all this and that. And we have these very strong emotions, right? We have the cops saying, look, man, I, I, we're just trying to do the safe thing. We, don't train for the, we weren't trained for this, right? We're trying to do our best. You have the animal rights folks coming up doing some kind of chanting, you know, whatever, talking to the spirit of the animal. They actually determined, they communed with him, and they determined his name was Braveheart. I don't know how they figured that out, but they figured out his name was Braveheart. Um, you know, and, and that's going on. You have, you have the, the environmental advocates saying like, well, we need new policies, right? You have the, the families, like the, the mom with the kid and, and the family saying like, well, you know, I didn't want the animal to die, but I don't want my kid getting eaten, right? Um, and, and on and on and on. And so this quickly becomes um, not a, a, a objective, scientific measure this value. It's become in the arena of public opinion and it's become in the arena of controversy and anger and hurt. Um, and so that gets to the idea of what is risky um, and, 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 and what, what is a threat and, and how do we know if something's a threat or not? And this is a key thing for many of our conservation challenges. So the perception of, of what's dangerous is often much greater than, than the real risk. So we can talk about COVID, terrorism, all these various things. Oftentimes we have the perception of risk and the reality of the amount of risk that's actually posed. And so we can talk about this in many different contexts, but, but we've been getting a, a, a front seat view of this in the last few years in the wake of the pandemic and these other, these other issues. Um, Oftentimes, when we feel like we need to act very quickly, the, the justification is that there's an imminent threat. There's an imminent threat to people, so therefore we need to do something. We need to mow down the field, we need to shoot the predator, um, all that kind of stuff. And indeed, our culture has, has given us all of these models for us to follow. The predator stalking us, the, 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 the poor, helpless woman that can't defend herself against the evil predator and a man has to be a, a dude with a hat and a gun has to step up there and save her, you know, all these things. Um, you know, the popular, how do you survive a mountain lion attack? You don't need to survive a mountain lion attack. You're never going to get attacked by a mountain lion. But nevertheless, these are very popular cards at Christmas and books to give and how do you survive a, and do a fox special on it and all that kind of stuff. Um, the reality is the risk from mountain lions is very, very fleetingly small. There are many massively greater risks to us that we don't seem to worry about, that we go about our lives and are not, not bothered by it at all. So on the upper left here is West Nile virus. This is, these are all in the same areas where we have mountain lions. So West Nile virus. West Nile virus first identified in the United States in 1999 in a tire in New Jersey. Um, West Nile virus is, is a, a mosquito spread virus, came from Africa, and is spread across the U.S. now. So uh, as in 2002 or 2003, I can't remember, um, it first showed up in California. And the, the, the bar graph here on the upper left, let me just orient you, this is, this is year right here on the x-axis. This is how many humans have been infected by this virus, confirmed infections. So as of last year, almost 8,000 people have been infected by this virus, and 344 people have died, right? 
um, because of, as a direct result of that infection. We could talk about something like Lyme disease, right, which is, which is a, a, a protozoan, uh, which is a, a, a disease born by ticks, a tick-borne disease. What I'm showing you here on the left in the, in the yellow are counties in California that only have the tick, or red counties that have the tick and the, and the parasite. All over the place, right, all over the place. Um, in the wake of this event in Palo Alto, a little bit later, that same year in 2004, a bike, a mountain biker was attacked and killed in Orange County, in a park in Orange County. Um, what appears to have happened was the mountain biker got a flat tire and pulled off the side of the road and was kneeling down, bending like in a ball like to, to take his tire off. So he was very small, he crouched down very small and the mountain lion jumped on his, the back of his neck and bit the back of his neck, and that's how he was killed. Uh, attacked another biker, didn't kill the other biker, and then um, we sent some trackers out, it found the animal, killed him, and confirmed that he had human you know, uh, uh, tissues in, in his gut. So that, that was the individual that did it. Um, but very rare event, you know, it had been decades since anybody had been attacked by a mountain lion in that area of Orange County. Nevertheless, the next thing that came on was this controversy. So now you see people saying, I'm packing my gun when I'm going out mountain biking in Orange County, because you can't try, right? A million times more dangerous, a bunch of people walking around with guns. Um, but, that, but that is, generally speaking, accepted. So to put it in context, about since from 1900 to last year, we have about nine and a half thousand humans in the U.S. In, in the greater U.S. or I should say the continental U.S. killed by lightning. A rare event, but nevertheless about nine nine and a half thousand people ish. People that get stung by a bee or wasp and have an anaphylactic shock and, and unfortunately can't breathe and and die, about 4,300 people in that same time period. Bitten by a dog and then die either from rabies or just the, the physical trauma of the bite, 1,500 people have died. West Nile virus, and this one is only up to 2021, I couldn't get the data for 2022. So as of you know, the year before, um, almost 2,500 people in the US have died from West Nile virus. Rattlesnakes, 500-ish people. Mountain lions, 17 people and most of them were in the early part of the 1900s. So the relative, all of this energy and all of this fear and all this worry is massively, massively, massively overblown. This weekend, three texts on my phone because there's a mountain lion on campus, right? Oh my God, watch out, mountain lion, oh my God. And you know, come on, this is not that dangerous a thing. Okay, let's talk about some of this. So when we start to talk about these controversies and, and these issues in conservation biology this semester, we're gonna start with the facts. So that was sort of a dramatic sort of entrance, but normally we're gonna start with the biology and we're gonna work our way through. So in the case of mountain lions, let's start talking, uh, sorry, firstly, any questions about that stuff so far? Making sense? Yeah. Is there, is there like a social thing about why mountain lions are seen as dangerous as they are, where other things are not? Great question. Like, in my brain, less dangerous than mountain lions, but Great question. So why is it that we humans have such a thing about these, these predators, right? I don't know, maybe that's a subject for a future discussion. That, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Maybe we we're gonna talk about that. But it's, I would say it's not just mountain lions. It's also like great white sharks um, and, and similar things, similar to these top predator type, type critters. Um, ideas, I, I mean, we'll talk about it in the future, but, but for right now, any quick ideas that come to your heads? Why, why are we so freaked out about mountain lions? Say again? Fear mongering, okay. Okay. Okay, so fear mongering? Probably just because like California is just like the biggest thing in California. It's the last thing left that's big. Yeah. That's scary and big and that we don't control. So there's something about the fact that it's wild. So there's something about the fact that you and I don't know exactly aren't controlling it, like a dog on a leash kind of thing. Right. 
Right. Yeah, so, so, so a lot of times people say, oh, it's, it, we're just instinctually or, or we inherently have fear. Maybe there's some aspect of that, but you're right. It's definitely a learned thing. All of those novels, all of the, all of the media, all of the, all of the stuff that we, little funny jokes, haha, as a kid, we tell each other that kind of begin to reinforce it. Somebody had some ideas over here. Okay. Sure. Yeah, there's definitely something about something with these teeth. You know, as opposed to a little stinger or a little, a little whatever. Um, as scary as COVID might be, right? It's like, oh, it's a little virus. Whereas something's like, ah, you know, going to actually potentially rip my shoulder off. That's, that can be visceral for a lot of folks. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's right. I think, I think, you know, the idea, so similar to like the, the teeth, that it's got teeth is this idea that it, it is kind of a bigger thing, right? I mean, that it's not like a little fly, it's, it's a big, like if that thing were to run into me, it would knock me down kind of thing, right? So, so there, there is something about the physical size relative to us that's also, I'm sure part of that, that conceptualization. Any other thoughts? Good, good, I like them, I like them, let's keep them going. Um, okay, let's talk about what is, what is a mountain lion. Um, whenever we talk about these critters, we wanna know their common name and their Latin name, right? So this, this guy, um, uh, the current genus and species, Puma concolor, uh, used to, the, the genus used to be Felis, but now it's Puma. Whenever we write these Latin names, they're italicized. Theoret technically speaking, you can also just underline them, but that was back in the day when we used typewriters. The best is to italicize them. So you guys should always italicize the name. The very first time you're telling me a, an, an organism or writing it in a report, you list both the Latin name and the common name, or if there's multiple common names, you can say multiple common names the very first time. Then depending on your audience, you could then default to the Latin name or you could default to the common name, but we're gonna give them both to start with, right? In the first, first paragraph, the first sentence, whenever we first introduce the term. Okay, let's first talk about what they look like. Okay, so the, the, these, these individuals are sexually dimorphic, meaning the males and females present slightly differently or a lot differently, depending on what organism we're talking about. In this case, they look generally the same, but the males are bigger. So the males are about 50% on, you know, full-grown adult males about on average 50% bigger than a typical female. The most distinguishing characteristic is the tail. So their tail is about one-third of their body length. Nothing else on our continent is like that. Um, everything else that has a tail, it's much, much shorter. Um, so the tail is diagnostic. Where were they, okay, so first is what do they look like? Next we're, we wanna know, hey, where are they, are, are they naturally found or where were they historically found, you know, depending on the context. So let's talk about distribution. So the distribution um, is this, uh, is this um, red area here in the Americas. This is the, this is the historic distribution, but it's still pretty much their, their, their current distribution. So um, there was a bit more connectivity between Texas and Florida, um, but, but where all this red is, you potentially could run into a mountain lion. Um, they have relatively large territories, and it, the, t the size of their territory, I should say first of all, they're territorial, I should say this, so they're, they're not just randomly walking through the forest. They have an area where they patrol um, it's going to depend on the prey base. If there's a lot of food around, they will have a smaller territory. If there's less food around, they'll have a larger territory. One of these guys can easily go 8, 10, 12 miles a night. 
right, in a patrol. So these are, again, it's going to vary, but on the order of, of 20 square miles, sometimes up to 100 square miles of territory for one individual. Um, as far as how many are there across North and across the Americas right now, somewhere on the order of, best guess, 20 to 50,000 ish individuals. In California, guesstimations are around four to 6,000 individuals in California. So something on that order of magnitude. Um, yeah. And, and, and they used to be the widest, had the widest distribution of a new world terrestrial um, mammal. Um, that's shrunk a bit as we've nuked them from certain areas. Out in nature, okay, so, so, so that's, what do they look like? First thing we're gonna ask. Next we're gonna ask, okay, where are they found? How many of them are there? And then thirdly is, tell me about their ecology. Tell me about their natural history, right? So uh, these individuals, typically live on the order of about up to a decade or so in the wild. P-22, which we'll talk about more later, the, the, the famous mountain lion that lived in Griffith Park in Los Angeles, uh, just died. We, we just had to euthanize him uh, over the Christmas holiday, uh, was about 12 years old. And that was relatively old for a, a wild mountain lion. In captivity, they can live for much longer. So we have had individuals in captivity live to you know, 25 years, or I think even more now. Um, they, when they reproduce, mom typically has two cubs per litter. Um, once she has those cubs, the cubs will stay with mom for about a one to two years, uh, typically about a year and a half on average. Um, these are asocial mammals, meaning they do not socialize. The only time adults come together, generally speaking, I'll show you some pictures that show that's not always the case, but, but generally speaking, the only time adults come together are to mate. If they come together for any other reason, they're gonna fight. Um, so uh, the juveniles will stay with mom until she goes back into estrus and she kicks them out and then she goes into another reproductive cycle. Um, what else I wanna say? Uh, they are our largest, car largest wild native carnivore here in California. Um, and they are an apex predator in a lot of the communities where they live, meaning the top eater of things. They generally have a lifestyle that tends to emphasize, not always, but tends to emphasize crepuscular foraging, meaning at dawn and dusk. You and I have great eyesight midday. You and I have okay eyesight at night. Not great, but it's okay. You and I have crappy, as, as do most, most mammals, crappy eyesight at dawn and dusk. Think about driving home in the sun. Right? You're like, well, I can't see, and I can't show my eyes bright enough. That's where these guys rock and roll. So these cats, their eyes are optimized to really work well in that sort of twilight time. It's not super, super dark. It's not super, super bright, but that betwixt between. And so that's really where they're most effective in terms of their predation. Yeah. Do they forage on the crossfit? Yeah, so, 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 so we'll, we'll feed on whoever they can get at that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and, how they, and again, how they forage is they're not like a cheetah. Like you see cheetahs or, or these you know, wolf packs you know, charging and running down uh, prey. That's not how these guys, that's not their jam. Their jam is to sit somewhere, typically on a big oak branch, could be a, a rock ledge, somewhere over a game trail, somewhere over a deer. They're, they're, the thing they want to eat more than anything else in the world, anyone want to guess? Deer. deer, deer. Deer, 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 deer. They'll eat raccoons, they'll eat rabbits, they'll eat squirrels, but what they really want to eat is deer. That's their favorite thing to eat. Um, and so what they're gonna do is they're gonna find a, a trail, and, oh my gosh, here's, there's evidence of a critter walking around here. Okay, cool and I'm gonna find a place where I can perch just like over that cop car, right? 
and just hang and just be quiet for a while and still and just watch and look at the behavior and, and sort of maybe for a couple days even maybe watch the behavior of these critters go. And then when I have my opportunity, I'm going to pounce. And I'm going to pounce and I'm either going to grab onto the, the, the throat and suffocate the critter with my jaw, very strong jaw, or I'm going to come over the back of the head and snap the neck and squeeze really, really, really tight. And kill the thing. And then go, oh my god, I kill the thing. And then like drag it off the trail. And just like if you guys have a cat at home, the cat goes poop and then the cat kind of scratches, right? It's gonna scratch, 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 bury the carcass and it runs away. And it goes, anybody see me? Anybody see me? Anybody see me? And it runs away and it waits. And it waits, and it waits, and then if nobody's coming by, nobody sees it for a while, it'll go back after a little bit, knock those leaves off, eat for a little bit, and then cover it up with leaves and run away. And then over the course of a couple days, come back and slowly eat that. This, is, this appears to be an evolutionary um, adaptation to living in an area with grizzly bears. Where if a grizzly bear is like, I'm gonna eat that, right? There's no way you, this guy can fight off a grizzly bear. We had cal grizzly bears, wild grizzly bears in California until 1923 when we shot the last wild one. It's mounted in, you can go see it preserved in, a, in a, the Steinhardt Aquarium up in, up in the California Academy of Sciences up in um, San Francisco. But, but that's, how these guys, that's how these guys make their living, right? So they're not, they, they're, they're big apex predator, but they're always afraid of somebody else coming and kicking their butt. This is current mountain lion habitat in California, the dark pink. Um, so where are they not? Why are they not in the Central Valley? So yeah, nothing to hide. Historically, that was mostly wetlands. And while these guys can be all over the place and technically they can walk through wetlands, they're, they're not. They're not optimized to walk through wetlands, so that's not good. And now it's just crops, so there's no branches for them to pounce over over prey and stuff. So that's not really good. And then what about the lower right part of the state? Same thing, right? Not not a lot of. I mean, they're they're there. They're they are. You can find them there, but very low density, right? There's not a lot of prey base. Not a lot of stuff for them to eat there. So, so the the middle part of the state is is a landscape thing. The far right is probably a landscape and a prey. Actually, both of them are probably landscape and prey base that explains the current pattern. But everywhere else that's pink, you could totally run into a mountain lion. So here's what they look like, right? So again, this is, this is, this is an unusual picture. You don't normally see them like this. But this is the, so, so you see this you know, classic brown. And, uh, and we have this nice long tail. Um, I'm going to pause this. We'll pick this up next time when we talk about more of these characteristics. But I want to talk about this other um, skin first. So before we wrap today. <laughs>